Hello YouTube, if you're watching this, I am dead. I'm not really dead, I'm just out enjoying the summer weather in my summer air. But I'm not leaving you hanging, I'm releasing all these nice little clips from the live stream that has not previously been shown on YouTube. Before we get on to the clip, I would like to thank this week's summer sponsor, Brilliant. Thank you so much for supporting the show and me being out in the sun and the audience, you, getting these nice little clips. Brilliant has been with us for a long time. They are a great way to learn computer science fundamentals and machine learning concepts. You can just go there and they have interactive courses where you like filling stuff and they give you like, oh, you're doing good, you're doing good, you're making progress, instead of just a video where like you're just watching. It's really, really nice and it's, it's such a good way of learning concepts like these. Um, so if you feel like maybe doing that during the summer, maybe like there's a rainy day today or tomorrow and you think like, I should do something productive with my day, then go to brilliant.org slash FFF uh, and just sign up. That link is also in the episode description. Um... Do you have any suggestions when and how to reuse styles, uh, variables, classes, etc.? What's the limit between overgeneralization and replication? Ask Slavic 57. Oh man, that's a good question too. I heard someone, um, oh man, I see his names again, I'm not going to be able to remember it. They were mentioning that the one of the best things to think about when you're thinking, so this sounds to me like a CSS architecture question, right? It's yeah. like, um, how do I how do I write class names that are semantically meaning to meaningful to us, but also maybe are performant and help me scale and have um, isolation? Yeah, but the thing is, like variables in CSS are, to me, like a little bit more expensive than normal variables. Like they're very verbose. Um, like you have to mm. like tie, like do these var things and it's like dash dash. Yeah, and, yeah. and since since they're uh, yeah, they just tend to take a lot more space than no due to the whole scoping thing. Um, they they just seem to me like they they take more space inside of my my CSS than normal. So I find myself a little bit more reluctant to introduce variables than I am when I'm programming, for instance, JavaScript. I agree. Typing them um, feels a little tedious, um, and. I don't know why, but eventually I just kind of got over it. It's almost like yeah. when I was first learning how to write um, action script. Let's just go like way back in the day. And I remember watching a, a YouTube video of someone writing a function. They were like, okay, we're just going to make a var function, open parentheses and brackets and hit enter. And they're like, in like one second, they had the whole fucking function definition created perfectly with their cursor right in the middle. And I'm like, what the hell just happened? I'm like, writing function is a pain in my ass right now. And that person makes it look like it's yesterday's, you know, breakfast um and so i don't know i feel like uh, the var keyword is sort of similar to that where yeah. at this point i agree in the beginning i was like dude this is weird why didn't i just get like a dollar sign or something simple um but it turns out there's uh compatibility reasons that they did it and once you've typed it out enough of it it's like no big deal plus with autocomplete or whatever um but uh, is, what was the original question was more about oh yeah so like class names and architecture yeah i wanted to sh share um, there was a warning that someone gave, and I thought it was a pretty sane warning, which is you should either go um, OOCSS, which is kind of like functional CSS. I, I find them very, very similar, where you've abstracted all of your styles into single responsibility classes versus extreme scoping, which is like you could use Shadow DOM or CSS and JS mm. solution. And the warning is anytime you try to hybrid and go in the middle, you end up with kind of scale issues because now you're trying to balance two architectural patterns mm. instead of one. The advice being pick one, pick either extreme scoping or pick abstracted class names. And those will, they'll both be completely scalable. They'll both work fine for your project. But by choosing one, you're limiting the amount of like learning and, and um, management you're going to have to do of your architecture. So I thought that was good advice. Um, and that means that you can kind of name your class names however you want. It just depends on which strategy you're choosing. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, like I think that there was an excellent, uh, excellent, um, excellent answer. Like focus on consistency. 
because it's not ob like one thing that I find with CSS is that I don't know if, if that was still the state, but when I back when I was <laughs> working as a developer um, <laughs> at, at Spotify. For the man. Yeah, for the man. Um, there was like CSS almost existed in this special little world where like normal programming hygiene didn't didn't exist. Like for instance, like notice that people were not writing comments in CSS at all. Which mm is like nuts to me because CSS very often needs comments in order to explain what the hell it is doing. Like I find that CSS can sometimes be completely unreadable to like what, why, what is the intent behind this little thing. Is that still a thing that people don't write comments in CSS? Yeah, it's probably worse now that people are... Um kind of writing components or styles in components where they're they're initially thinking that they're probably only going to write a few styles. I feel like this is CSS is normal, but this is also JavaScript's problem, which is like, oh, I only need a little bit of this right now. Yeah. I don't need to pull in anything quite that organized. I'll just write some styles really quick and it'll be fine. And then you're like, oh, wait, but that one edge case. Oh, yeah, and that other thing. And by the time you know it, you've got 100 lines of CSS because it is, it's very capable, but it's very verbose. Yes. Um, and so by the time you've completed something, it sort of all looks like soup. Um, and I think that, I don't know, I don't think there's any way around that yet. Even with, you know, single file components where we're trying to put it all into one view, um, it still gets, it still gets crazy. And yeah, I think comments would be nice in there, but I don't see very many comments either. So, um, what is your, um, like... What is your uh, feeling here while we're talking about uh, CSS architecture on um, uh, like JavaScript, like CSS generated by JavaScript, like these React style components and stuff? Like, yeah. personally, I absolutely loved the fact that I can construct um, and combine and compose um, CSS as JavaScript objects because it gives me like all of the power of object spread and like it allows me to use the same language as as I use it just makes a lot of sense to me um, but a lot I know that a lot of people uh, hate that like what what is what what is your opinion and like what has been your experience there so I'm a weirdo again. I like them all. I think there's a lot to learn from this strategy. I, I okay. So I'm a huge fan of destructuring and spread. And basically, my goal with JavaScript Dark is to create the least like, MPJ rip, <laughs> RIP my eyes super wide. I'm gonna try yeah. to put down the ISO of, of the camera one notch and see if that helps. <laughs> yeah, do it. That's why I was referencing uh, Bioshock Infinite. I was like, dude, you look like you're exalted up in the heavens. Uh... Sorry if that uh, didn't come through. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, no, I like CSS and JS. So I, I mean, this is the other thing I liked about your early videos too. You don't use semicolons, which, by the way, do you still not use semicolons uh, even if you're typescripting? No, no, no. I don't use uh, I don't use semicolons if I if I get to make the choice. Yeah. Yep. Same. So um, I I just love the expressive nature of JavaScript as it is in vanilla. And I'll go TypeScript with anybody, and I'll go CSS and JS with anybody. Um, but I think what happens is is we start – everything's a trade-off. This is something that your show has been very, very good at, at showcasing. And when you do CSS and JS, the, tr the trade-off becomes the more JavaScript you put in there, the more someone has to know JavaScript and CSS to get the task done than just knowing CSS. So it's like, oh, well, sweet, they're spreading the contents out into here and they're making and they're concatenating and they're making a new one and then they're, uh, and then all of a sudden this like little block can be doing very, very powerful things. But for you, as the consumer of someone else's code, the complexity levels are much higher for you to understand like what's actually happening here, what's being applied. Um, and you have to set breakpoints to go see what CSS is actually coming in. Um, debugging a lot of the CSS and JS scenarios can be um, a little tricky. Th there's still there's a lot to gain there. Um, I think one of the, the biggest benefits I've seen from CSS and JS is bringing CSS into the dependency graph, being able to shake it. Yeah. Um, that stuff is super. That 
the platform needs to get on something like that really fast because um, I think that's really powerful and meaningful to have CSS in the dependency graph like that. But anyway, it's all a trade-off. Um, I think it's really fun to write. Uh, I think it's more complex to write, which I think also t like tickles that side of your brain. That's the same thing that TypeScript does where you're like, ha, 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 I just wrote a badass component. It is super complex and amazing. Watch all my friends yeah. be impressed by my my radical you know, use of TypeScript. And then same thing with CSS and JS. It's like, look at my super rad. I spread these three things into this one. I composed a new clip. Bam, and then my styles are done. I'm like, cool. Um, you know, that looks the same right over here. It's just like a little block, but it it's all trade-offs, and I like studying these things uh, for what people uh, are excited about. That's my biggest thing is I go in and I and I study, like, what got them excited about this thing? I want to be excited about stuff. And I go figure out what's exciting, and then I go figure out, like, whoa, what did I lose? Um, and sometimes it's things like syntax highlighting. Sometimes it's things like learning proprietary knowledge. Um, you know, every framework I've ever written in, which I I still would write another app in a framework, but I also, if you give me the choice, I do not want to use a framework. The reason being is the more I invest in a framework, the more I learn about the framework, then the framework, at least historically, has always disappeared. And everything I knew about it and all those hours and hours and hours I spent learning the niche little edge cases of that shit are gone. And they're just completely useless and so it's like all these CSS and JS libraries, I go study them. I'm like, cool, but look at that little choice they made. That's a choice I have to stash and re re recurringly reapply yeah, sure. to know how it's working. And then eventually, like, I think it's cool, but anyway. Yeah, um, Phil Trem so says, like, stuff. I just started working with style components. I like, love it. And then Chris Kerr goes, React style components? I'm on the other end there. I hate them. So, like, people are going to, like, develop preferences around them as well so you're gonna have like people on your team that prefer one of them and another person that prefers another of them like we don't if we just use like there's no with javascript we we only sort of have one javascript we're kind of introducing typescript now which is like mm, hurts me a little bit because now there's like two ways of doing javascript but um, but but either way, like there's a big value of just having like a way of doing things, and everybody's centered around that and and focus around that. Yeah, and that's I think, you know, most people when they when they argue pro framework, and they would say something along those same lines, like, well, yeah, but you see, this team over here has written all the documentation. I don't have time to do that, so we'll adopt this framework, and then I'll send all my noobs over there. And they can go learn how to build stuff uh, from that documentation. I can stay over here doing whatever it was I was doing. Um, and I agree that that works out pretty good. But I think what you end up with is people head head buried in docs like all day. Yeah. They can't get shit done without the docs up. So the docs are up all day. They don't ask anyone for help. So instead they spend six hours reading the docs to solve one stupid little bug. And it could have been solved maybe in five minutes if they asked their superior. So it's like, again, trade-offs like – there's scalability to gain, but we're like losing some human touches sometimes. It's like I like linters too, 